it's not just that gold is uh, an excellent, not, nothing's perfect. It's not just an excellent remedy for the financial platforms and insolvency around the global economy. It's like a defusing agent for war because it forces the war-mongering nations to step back. While some online bullion dealers continue to charge almost $2 over spot for one ounce silver rounds, SD Bullion is selling one ounce silver rounds at only 49 cents over spot on any quantity. Again, that's 999 fine silver for just 49 cents over spot for any quantity. If you haven't joined the over 40,000 precious metals investors by making the switch to SD Bullion, what are you waiting for? You could save hundreds or even thousands of dollars on your next order. SD Bullion, the lowest prices, period. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com and back with us today is Dr. Jim Woolley, editor of the Hattrick Letter found on GoldenJackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure as always, Elijah. All right. Well, I'd first like to discuss the geopolitical tensions that are growing right now between the U.S., China, Russia, and North Korea. A lot of people I've been interviewing recently have said we're leading towards World War III. What is your perspective? When have we not been leading toward World War III in the last four years? What's, what's new? I mean, I don't mean to be petulant, but how is this any different from the tensions with the Ukraine war. How is this any different from, uh, say, the Turks shooting down a Russian jet fighter uh, and the U.S. getting involved with a lot of different things with Turkey and, and Syria? How is this any different from the U.S. being involved with a failed Turkish coup? where Russia came to the rescue. How, how is this any different from what we've been seeing for a very long time? I, I don't, I'll, I'll be very honest with you, and I've been saying this uh, recently, that uh, I don't get caught up in the nonsense. And the nonsense recently is all about North Korea. Uh, I have a, it's not just a motto, but it's a way of thinking regarding North Korea that I've, I've had in practice since probably the 1990 decade. I pay no attention to North Korea, and I never miss anything. Now, that sounds kind of stern and rigid, but... Can you point to anything that's ever happened in North Korea in the last 20 years? Can you point to anything that resulted in any kind of follow-up consequence in the last 20 years? I cannot. But this time seems to be different. How many times do we hear that? This time is different. Anytime you hear this time is different, 90% chance it's not different. This is different in uh, the year 2000, early in the, in the year, uh, with the stock run-up. This looks for real. This looks like it's different in 2007 with the mortgage uh, rise, with, with the housing rise. This looks different. No, it's not different. It's all the same, just the boom and the bust. Well, North Korea looks like it's all the same the rise in saber rattling and then, then the, the quieting. Let me tell you what I think is going on with respect to North Korea. And this is not what you find in the news. I, I don't really deal with uh, becoming an insect for the tail of the dog of war. <clears throat> Here's what I think is going on. There are some things that we do know about North Korea that have been very evident for the last three or four years. They're a major marketer of amphetamines, and they're a major counterfeiter of $20 bills, the dollar. 
So what might be different now in the last, say, six to 12 months? Well, I'll tell you, they've expanded their heroin business. Now, why would that matter? Well, the United States with Langley and the Bush crime family have a 90% monopoly in the heroin business ever since they captured Afghanistan with the ruse that they were going to fight the Taliban. No such thing. In fact, the United States went into Afghanistan in 2001 when the Russians left. We didn't enter in March and April of 2003 when we said we entered three years before because that was where we went in to capture the heroin trade. So, I think what we have is a complex situation where there's a lot of talk regarding uniting the Koreas like the Germans united East Germany, West Germany. The Koreans might be interested in uniting North Korea, South Korea. This is a lot more thorny than the German unification ever could be because now it looks like, well, for instance, East Germany never threatened with nuclear missiles its neighboring Federation of Germany. But the, uh, the little clown group that runs North Korean government they're threatening to, to send missiles to Seoul, Korea. I think I think they've mentioned threats to uh, to China in some respects. I don't know whether they're missile threats, but they're threatened long-reaching ballistic missiles to the United States, which is really laughable because the United States has missile protection uh, called Star Wars, which was a different lie. During the Reagan administration, we claimed that all those billions, hundreds of billions of research for the Star Wars never resulted in a, su su a successful uh, laser beam type protection or weapon. And that's a total lie. It was a tremendous success. Uh, we have lots and lots of, rate, uh, of laser protection for missiles. And, and laser weapons to kill, uh, which we demonstrated in the streets of Panama City just a few years later, still during the Reagan administration. So back to North Korea, what's going on? Uh, we know that the Trump administration and the Chinese government are at odds over trade issues, over outsourcing, over tariffs. And uh, I think a lot of war has been waged in the financial front with respect to the RMB currency and with respect to perhaps some of the banking problems going on in China. The uh, United States is, I think, involved in, in encouraging the flight of money out of China and the Chinese are trying to halt that. There's a lot of issues going on. There are a lot, three or four different cross currents involved here. So maybe, okay, my, my view of North Korea, in addition to ignoring it, has been for 20 years that that is where the Chinese just pull a string and suddenly the United States is worried sick about something from that corner of Asia. And it seems to be working again, but this time we have the, the THAAD missile, T-H-A-A-D, missile defense system, uh, being put as emplacements along the South Korean borders. And it's a whole lot more than just missile defense. It's, it's very advanced monitoring and radar and, and could be for hacking. Um, so you don't just put missile, missile banks. You, you put a lot of radar, you put a lot of intelligence devices, you put snooping, you put hacking, you put a lot of different things in place. This is very complicated, but I noticed, not to my surprise, in the last week, a lot of tensions have been defused with respect to North Korea and the United States. And uh, some strange talk has been coming for more cultural exchanges, and I don't think they'll ever get to a unification because 
the uh, the distance economically and financially between East and West Germany was not small, but the distance between North and South Korea is absolutely enormous and an order of magnitude wider than it was with the Germanys. I keep coming back to the same point. This could be about heroin and black market that the U.S. government, hidden groups, hidden criminal organizations don't want. So they're looking perhaps to capture more of the heroin business in Asia. And we originally captured the Cambodian Triangle in the mid-70s, early 70s, as an offshoot of the Vietnam War. So we, when it comes to Asia and communism, uh, it's really never only about Asia and communism, nor their threats. I hope that answers the question. I don't see how Russia is involved in this, but uh, I think we're going to see a, a miraculous detente where the little moron inbred with the funny hairdo just quiets down. Remember about four months ago we had the false fake story about his assassination in, what was it, in Malaysia or Indonesia? I can't remember which of those two countries it was. Later to be determined, later to be determined that the victim was a double. So there's a lot of deception in this part of the world and I don't fall for much of it. I, I tend to ignore it and and miraculously, it, it seems to go away and detente returns and everything gets diffused. Uh, I think what we're going to probably see is some kind of a deal. We're not going to see it. We're going to, it's going to happen. Some kind of a deal where the, uh, the Chinese maybe guarantee that the heroin business stays local and doesn't get exported in competition with the Bushes. That's my take. Now, you've wrote in your recent article that it is possible that gold smothers war. So do you think moving to a gold standard, you've t talked about this whole idea of this gold trade note that you think will emerge. Do you think this could save us from war? Well, I, I do. I do think it is possible, yes, that, that gold can save us from war. Um, it's, it's very complicated how that might happen. Um, it's actually has a side that, that might seem rather simplistic, you know, like a kid in a playground. Uh, we've got gold, therefore everything is everything's going to be fine. Um, in this case, let's just suppose that gold was never a potential in, in the global situation for finance and economics. Let's just suppose that, that gold uh, just never had the volume, didn't have the usability, and didn't have the, the history. Let's just assume that for a minute. And let's just say that Russia and China were thinking about making the RMB, the Chinese um, currency, on equal ground with the dollar in the entire eastern sphere in all of Asia and in all the former Soviet republics and many of the emerging market nations and in, in the BRICS nations, although it's going to be very difficult in South America um, in, in the U.S. shadow. Let, let's just suppose that it was going to be the U.S. dollar versus the Chinese RMB. Well, if that was the case, then then war could continue and, and nations using the RMB would be vulnerable to attack by the United States and all of its minions, like Israel, uh, and the terrorist groups like ISIS that are at the U.S. command. ISIS is a U.S. and Israeli construct for those who are still operating in a state of vast ignorance. Uh, if gold were not part of, of an, any equation, the U.S. could continue willy-nilly attacking any nation choosing to avoid the dollar and to work within the Chinese sphere of RMB. There's, there would be no limit. There would be no avenue toward 
a real positive recourse, a real a real fixed definitive reform solution because the RMB would basically be based on the full faith in government and word and all this for the Chinese. So you'd have the word of the Chinese and a legitimate system promised versus the word of Washington and New York and a system that would be promised as honest also, and neither one could be enforced. The key is, is enforcing with something legitimate. Now, enter in, and, and you know, you, you would just get just complete mayhem because there's no potential true remedy and valid system. It's just the Chinese fake money system versus the U.S. fake money system. And, and they can just beat each other up to death. Okay. But if gold is part of the equation, Elijah, then one side could impose the legitimate platforms that I've been talking about for the last year or two. They could institute the gold trade note and remove the treasury bill, U.S. treasury bill, that form of the dollar, as trade payment, like for oil or container vessels or for cargo full of, of uh, ships full of cargo full of commodities, grains, uh, coal, cement, lumber, whatever. Uh, if the trade payment platform turns into the gold trade note, then the Treasury bill with the United States cannot adequately compete with that. The key is to compete adequately. And the U.S. could, could not on the trade payment basis because a gold trade note would be much more honorable than a treasury bill. Okay, look at it right now. The United States takes a, 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 a ship full of container vessels or a ship full of oil and passes out another big glob of treasury bills. Where do the treasury bills come from? We just print them. And foreign countries don't want that because they're saying, why should we accept more printed dollars in the form of treasury bills when we've got so many sitting in our bank in the form of treasury bonds and the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government are printing money willy-nilly like fools to cover their debts? This is not a legitimate form of payment for trade and and the dollar gets rejected the treasury bill gets rejected as a payment form for trade and they look for an alternative and they see the gold trade note and they go wow this is backed by gold they can't print gold gold has intrinsic value it has legitimate properties and they prefer gold over the treasury bill Okay, that's trade. Now, consider banking. They look at their, their banking reserves. They see uh, tens or hundreds of billions of dollars worth of treasury bonds, tens or hundreds, and they conclude these are at risk. These treasury bonds, dollar form, they're at risk because the Federal Reserve is printing money to cover the dollar debt coming from the United States. So the problem is that the United States is using and abusing the global currency reserve, namely the dollar. So these countries look at their bank reserves and say they're not safe. We would like to transfer from the dollar, the treasury bonds, into gold bullion because that's safer. So you know, on a second front, the dollar would not be able to compete adequately versus gold. Okay, how does this relate to war? Well, if gold comes into the equation, if gold comes into practice with trade payment and bank reserves, then the United States 
suffers two big impacts. The first is that its war machine does not get exactly shut down. It gets put on, uh, I, I, I hate to call it a defensive, but it has to switch tracks. The U.S. war machine would not be able to operate with the free credit card from the U.S. dollar. It would have to switch over and be paid for by its narcotics funds. The Bush and Langley team would have to take control of almost all war costs, and I guarantee you they would be less. The second impact would be the United States would have to launch a new currency because the dollar, namely the Treasury bill, would not be honored or accepted in trade payment. Well, what's so important about trade payment? Well, that's where all the imports come into the United States for the supply chain for the entire economy. That's very important. Okay, so the war machine would have to switch tracks and be funded by narcotics, while the economy and its supply chain would have to depend on the new dollar, which because of the fundamentals for the U.S. would suffer regular and frequent extreme devaluations. Now remember the fundamental, this is really almost hilarious for most Americans. They don't know what the deficit is for trade, uh, but it's $550 billion a year and growing, which means that the United States would have to discount the dollar in, toward, in order to attract more interest to invest in the United States, while there is extremely little interest in investing in the United States, while the U.S. government goes on its merry way trying to wreck the economy and foment civil strife in the form of the Soros NGO groups to demonstrate against Trump. I don't want to get into the election issues at all. Uh, so the United States does not relax on its corporate taxes. The United States government does not relax on its federal regulations. It doesn't relax on its on its tariffs and trade war that's still active. So attracting money to invest inside the United States is, is not really attractive. It's not really successful. It's not going anywhere. All right. In the face of the U.S. having to jump switch its war machine into the narcotic pure funding, which would result in a retraction, a, a pullback, and in reaction to the United States economy having to deal with uh, a, a domestic-only dollar, which I call the new shice dollar, uh, which would be devalued, uh, in the face of those two reactions, the United States would lose its aggressive capability, its ability to wage war and aggression through predatory means would be reduced tremendously. That's what I mean by the gold standard might save us from war, by putting the United States on the defensive, by forcing their military to gear down. And, you know, you, you cannot move from U.S. government uh, funding for the Defense Department, which is hardly defensive anymore. It's very offensive and aggressive. You can't jump from government funding to narcotics Bush Langley funding smoothly. You can't. It, it, that's what I mean, Elijah. And it's not just that gold is uh, an excellent, not, nothing's perfect. It's not just an excellent remedy for the financial platforms and insolvency around the global economy. It's like a defusing agent for war because it forces the war-mongering nations to step back. 
All right. Well, moving on here, I'd like to move our focus to the European Union because Emmanuel Macron won the French presidential election, defeating far-right anti-EU candidate Marine Le Pen. Now, some of the people I was interviewing were saying that if Le Pen won, that could spell the end of the European Union. So now that Macron has won, what is your perspective on the future of the European Union? Do you think it's safe, at least for now, from breaking up further? Well, it's safe for the next couple months. But I don't think it's safe at all because you haven't yet seen the backlash from all the vote fraud. Uh, Let's just review some of the evidence out there. About one third of all the ballots that were for Le Pen's voters, they were all destroyed, torn up, and rejected by the official government mechanisms. About one third. Okay. So there looks to be a rather concerted effort to tear the ballots and make them invalid between the hands of the voter and the hands of the counter. Furthermore, Something like, well, okay, it, it's not the same in France as in the United States. Uh, they, they, they have a, a different system. There were more ballots printed for potential Macron voters than ballots printed for potential Le Pen voters. If they wanted to, they could have made the vote for Le Pen zero by not printing any ballots for Le Pen. Do you see how stupid this is? Okay, if they just want to print out a majority of Macron ballots, then there won't be much of any Le Pen ballots. Do you see how stupid this is? Furthermore, a half a million, just like Hillary, half a million phantom ballots without people associated with them were entered for Macron and counted. So you hear that Macron won by something like 20%. Okay, well, that sounds all very convincing and impressive. Um, Macron didn't come anywhere near Chirac's 60 or 62% from decades past. How much of the Macron vote was from invisible people? I mean, people who don't exist. I mean, ballots that were just produced out of nothingness and counted, even though they weren't legitimate. Remember, Stanford University Political Science Department came out with two reports. One was on how Hillary stole the primary from Bernie Sanders, and the second one, with with a lot of complete details, the second Stanford University report came out on how there were something on the order of seven or eight million illegal votes for Hillary from dead people and from people who weren't even citizens. So I ask, how many Arab refugees voted for Macron? How many Arab refugees who weren't yet citizens voting for Macron? How many invisible people voted for Macron, and how many votes for Le Pen were discarded. All right, you might think they rescued Europe, but what I think is the Rothschild Group, which has an active banker progeny, I think his name is Evelyn, uh, living in France and taking up, uh, spending a lot of time in Toulouse. France, which is basically turned into a satanic symbol city. The satanic symbols are all over the buildings and parks and and, and street walls and you name it. There are hundreds of satanic symbols there. Okay. It looks like they bought some time. They did not want the British exit to take place. It looks rather apparent that the Rothschilds did want Britain 
to exit the EU, but they don't want a coronation like France to exit the EU. I don't think it was a case where the British had an accidental exit. I think this was very much planned and executed by the Rothschilds because reportedly Rothschild made something on the order of a trillion and a half dollars on market bets that were successful, which meant that he knew how it was going to turn out. He knew how he was going to rig it and engineer it. They don't want France to exit the euro. And, you know, that's a complicated phrase sounding simple. They didn't want them to leave the European Union, nor did they want them to leave the monetary union where the euro currency is used. The euro is used as a name for both the union and the currency, and I don't like that. Uh, but it, it's, I mean, imagine the United States being called the dollar. The United States is the dollar union, so we don't want Texas to leave the dollar. Is that the union or the, or the currency? I mean, it's very, very dumb naming. But uh, that's, like, that's okay. The, the, the Satanist central bankers love confusion. Okay, I don't think they saved France because next comes the backlash of all the people who were in support of Le Pen uh, demonstrating and messing up the system and maybe boycotts, maybe pulling money out of certain banks to cause bank runs. Uh, I really do want to know what percentage of the Arab human garbage in France voted for Macron. I'm thinking it might have been about 115 percent, meaning more than there were Arabs. I think every one of the Arabs voted for Macron. It's one of the reasons for the influx. And not only that, maybe some Arabs who don't even exist voted for Macron. Um, this is very ugly stuff. What, what we're seeing in the last decade is a climax of voter fraud in what used to be some of the most respected Western industrialized nations. Remember that two or three years ago, I think it was two years ago, the Scots in Scotland tried to do an independence vote, and that also was interfered with. The referendum was full of fraud by the British banker cabal, leader, elite, group, whatever you want to call them. Uh, now the Scots are trying to reorganize and do it again and protect themselves from the fraud whose methods they have discovered. Okay, this is very ugly stuff, very complicated stuff, but I don't think the euro, by that I mean the European Union with their dictatorship in Brussels with the commission, I don't think they're going to save the EU. I think they're going to invite further rioting and discord and a lot of, uh, a lot of shouting in the French parliament and the EU parliament in Brussels. They're not going to get much done. Look for more defiance, say, with French companies trying to do business with Russia. Look for more defiance and, and more demonstrations and more rioting. Uh, the French are very good at rioting. They're very good at dumping tonnage of potatoes in the middle of highways. They have a track record. It seems like the Italians and the French are the most adept at throwing wrenches in the, in the works for the national economy in demonstrations, and I expect that's exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to be watching to see if they try to revive the, uh, the trade union that Obama started, uh, the Transatlantic Trade Partnership, I think it's called, uh, Transatlantic something partnership, I can't remember exactly, um, investment partnership maybe. Uh, there was a Pacific one and there was an Atlantic one, and when Trump was elected, both of them went on hold, if not ditched. And I think Macron is going to try to revive that, and his doing so might actually be uh, a litmus test or an area for the demonstration to ratchet up to a very, very high level 
of, of national objection and, and uh, demonstrations and oh gosh, it, it's going to get very nasty. I don't think I don't think Macron saved anything. He proved that the system is is broken and rigged. Uh, I think Le Pen probably would have won by a couple percent, but they didn't want to allow that. You got to look at the the half a million extra ballots uh, that were created for Macron and the half a million forged ballots for Macron, Macron. And you have to look at the enormous number of ballots that were discarded and thrown away because, oh, they had a little tear on the side. Well, what if the tear on the side was done by the Macron people? This is an invalid election and we're going to see the dirty tricks uh, become part of the news. I don't expect that they're going to avoid a storming of the Bastille.